In addition to fighting wars, disasters, and relief work, Chinese soldiers now have a new mission: having babies. At the critical moment, it appears that we soldiers have to take the lead. Yesterday, the army announced its measures for the implementation of the law of the People's Republic of China on population and family planning in the military. Seeing that young people are unwilling to have children and the fertility rate has fallen dramatically, the government has immediately come to think of us, the soldiers of the People's Liberation Army. The new policy promotes age-appropriate marriage and parenthood for military personnel, prioritizes birth and parenthood, and allows a couple to have up to three children. It also adds parental leave and care leave for parents of a single child, improves childcare and education, childcare services, and other programs. As well as better counseling, healthcare services, and technical services. In other words, it means that one family member serving in the military brings honors to the entire family. Military personnel having children is beneficial to the country and society. I think this policy came at just the right time. You see, first of all, the physical health of the soldiers has been strictly screened by the country, and they have been through military training, which can completely ensure that our next generation will have healthy genes. In addition, our military families have a strong patriotic culture. The children's patriotic education will surely save the country a lot of worry. I think after spreading this policy, there will certainly be more policies to encourage soldiers to marry and have children. I strongly approve this message. I'm one step short of accomplishing my quota. Married comrades in the military, let's go. China's demographic situation has attracted much attention as the growth rate declines year after year. It's expected that by 2023, the number of total annual births may drop to seven or eight million. That's a decline of 40 percent in five years, and millions short of the death rate. Now China is looking for a military solution to the declining birth rate. On September 7, 2023, the Central Military Commission of the CCP issued measures to encourage military personnel to have more children. Military personnel should marry at the right age and be allowed to have up to three children. In addition, it calls for better welfare such as parental leave and nursing leave for parents of a single child. The policy became effective on September 10. Xinhua News Agency reported that CCP General Secretary Xi Jinping signed an order as the chairman of the Central Military Commission to put the measures into law. It contains 33 articles providing support, assistance, and protection for military families in the areas of marriage, pregnancy, childbirth, child care, and education. According to the Xinhua report, this regulation regulates and strengthens family planning and preferential childbirth services and protection for military personnel, and establishes a technical service support system for the whole fertility chain to protect the legitimate rights and interests of military personnel who have followed the family planning policy, and to promote the family happiness of military personnel. The pro-natalist policy has elicited much comment. Lai Jianping, a former Chinese lawyer living in Canada and a master of international law at the China University of Political Science and Law, gives his take on the situation. This is a sign that China is about to become a militarist state. According to this law, the CCP will utilize the resources and power of the state and exhaust all means to support and help military families to have children in a multifaceted way. So that they can have the ability and conditions to have more children, it also means that the proportion of the military population in the total population will increase. He said, China hopes to produce more and more little soldiers through soldiers following military orders. The CCP can recruit more soldiers from military families. This is a measure the CCP takes when the general public is unwilling to have children, and the birth rate keeps dropping. The steep decline in China's population will impose a terrible burden on China's future economic development. The sudden drop of the population means that when the future generation grows up, they will have to shoulder quite a burden with a small population to support a relatively large number of the aging population. Under such circumstances, if the CCP still wants to take on the so-called unification of Taiwan and fight against the Western world, how can it win the war without the necessary resources?
Without national power, the CCP can't accomplish its objectives, even if Chinese citizens send all their children to the military. A modern military needs a lot of money to sustain it. A single missile costs tens of millions of dollars. If a country has no economic resources, it cannot afford to fight future wars. It's very likely that the CCP is now trying to solve these problems by introducing a new policy of supporting military births. It will utilize state resources to provide special benefits to certain groups of people. For example, the military, party cadres, and probably all civil servants who are more loyal to the CCP. They are encouraged to have babies. The CCP also wants to use these people as an example to motivate ordinary families to have children. At the end of the day, it still wants to solve the population problem. At the same time, it also wants to maintain the succession of the red bloodline of the CCP. However, with the current economic downturn that China is facing, the average family is already overburdened with financial and living pressures. With how expensive it is to give birth and raise children, there is little hope of solving China's declining population problem in the short term. The CCP admits that over 40 years of birth control has resulted in more than 400 million fewer children being born in China. In the face of the disappearance of demographic dividend and the serious aging problem, the CCP allowed the birth of a second child in 2016 and a third child in 2021. It has introduced many measures and policies to promote childbirth at the same time, but the results haven't been very good. So will the military follow the party's direction? Not necessarily. The party demands that soldiers put the party first and families and individuals can be sacrificed for it. However, corruption is rampant in the military and the theory of communism has likewise been bankrupt for a long time. In 1994, before China allowed a second child, a shocking incident took place on the streets of Beijing. On September 21, 1994, a shootout broke out near the embassy district in Beijing, where an active-duty military soldier fought with armed police officers. On that particular day, Canada's major television station suddenly broadcast an emergency live feed. A shootout broke out in the vicinity of the embassy district outside the Jiangguomen residential district of Beijing, the capital of China. People saw on the TV screen a yellow taxi's windshield shattered, a two-section bus covered in bullet holes, a wounded child of a diplomat crying and screaming inside a vehicle, and armed police and police officers rushing around with guns while gunshots continued to be heard. The Chinese government shut down satellite television immediately after the incident and banned journalists from reporting on the scene. Canadian journalists could broadcast the shootout before the ban because it took place underneath their diplomatic apartment and also because they anticipated what the Chinese government might do. This allowed a few precious moments of footage to be seen. All Chinese news media were ordered to remain silent on the matter. Only the Beijing Evening News was authorized by the Xinhua News Agency to publish a 100-word story that day. As a result, the price of the newspaper skyrocketed, with the highest price said to have been raised to 50 times its original price. The name of the serving officer was Tian Ming Jian. In this live broadcast of a battle between a field soldier and armed police and police officers, he showed the world the moves of a highly skilled soldier, including an impressive change of cartridges with one hand. Tian was a lieutenant and deputy company commander of the 12th Regiment of the 3rd Division of the Beijing Garrison at the time. He was just 30 years old and came from a rural village in Henan province. He was a smart, intelligent, hard-working and highly skilled military man, especially in firearms. He was a master of his craft. So why did this promising soldier take the road of no return? Tian's wife in the rural areas had given birth to a daughter. Like most people in China, he hoped that his wife would bear him a son. Because of the strict birth planning policy at the time, he kept his wife's pregnancy of a second child a secret. According to the CCP's political and ideological practice in the military, every year before October 1st, which was the anniversary of the CCP's regime in China, 
military leaders needed to map out the state of mind of their subordinates. They often do so by breaking into personal letters to get private information. In checking Tian's personal letters, the army learned that his wife was pregnant. If his second child were born, not only would he be punished, but the military officers at all levels, including the company, battalion, and regiment of which he was a member of, would all be implicated. The army then notified the local birth control office and sent someone to take his wife for a forced abortion. In the end, because the pregnancy had been nearly seven months, there was a medical accident. Not only was the baby, which was later proven to be a boy, lost, but even the mother lost her life due to excessive blood loss. Tien, as a soldier, couldn't protect his child and wife. So, he went to the embassy district in Beijing to take revenge on the society. In this armed confrontation, he fought alone against more than 1,000 armed policemen for three and a half hours. How many people were killed or injured in the shootout remains a mystery. The only ones who could be identified were a foreign diplomat and his son. In the end, Tian was also gunned down. It is said that the last sight of him was his eyes staring wide open, holding his gun tightly in his hand. Soldiers are required to obey the party's authority. They weren't allowed to have a second child. Now they are asked to take the lead in having more children. Are they willing to obey truly from their heart? Will they retaliate against the CCP in another way? Perhaps it wouldn't be a one-man battle like Tien's next time. In January 2023, the Chinese government announced that the number of births in China fell below the mark of 10 million to only 9.56 million in 2022. It was only 60% of the 2017 population, a record low since the CCP took power in 1949. Currently, China's fertility rate has fallen from 2.6 children per woman in the late 1980s to 1.15 in 2021, well below the threshold of 2.1 to maintain a normal population turnover between generations. For some experts, China's official figures aren't credible, and they believe the reality is much more serious. China officially discontinued its one-child policy on New Year's Day in 2016, allowing couples to have two children. In May 2021, the Chinese government announced that it would further deregulate its birth policy to allow a family to have three children. Some provinces and cities have also introduced their own measures to encourage births. For example, Shenzhen City has launched a consultation draft proposing a three-year cumulative subsidy of 19,000 yuan or US 2,600 for families with three children, while a city in Shandong has introduced a policy of exempting high school tuition fees for families with three children, etc. However, these measures have had little effect judging by the published data on the number of births. As previously reported, the education sector, especially preschool education, is the first to experience the impact of declining birth rates. The number of kindergarten enrollment has been declining over the years. The phenomena of it's hard to recruit a child emerged. The wave of kindergarten closures around the country has continued to spread. Many places in China have also introduced documents to abolish primary, secondary schools and kindergartens in rural areas. Of course, government documents won't say it straight. They use expressions like guiding advice on optimizing the layout of primary and secondary schools and kindergartens in rural areas. What can be predicted is that the impact of a declining population on kindergartens will continue to spread to primary and secondary schools. The experts analyze that given the declining school-age population, the enrollment of students in university will be impacted to a certain extent and many universities will shut down in the future. In July 2023, the Ministry of Education released data showing that in 2022, the number of kindergartens decreased by over 5,000 compared to 2021, and the number of children enrolled in preschool education decreased by almost 1.8 million compared with the previous year. There were 5,162 fewer general primary schools in China than in the previous year. Enrollment at the elementary school level was 811,900 fewer than the year 2021. Enrolled students were 478,800 fewer than 2021. Total classes at the elementary school level were 23,200 fewer, and there were 6,690 fewer elementary school teaching points than in 2021. 
At present, the main body of China's childbearing population consists of young people born in the 1980s, 90s, and 2000s. Currently, the number of young people who are single, unmarried, and infertile is on a gradual and growing trend. Despite incentives from the government, why are they still reluctant to have children? In a previous episode, we aired a man's monologue in which he explained why he didn't want children. We have included it here. Why am I childless, folks? Is it because I'm infertile? Absolutely not. As of now, my body is healthy. All health indicators are roughly normal. I have no children purely because I can't afford them. I mean, I can support them in terms of survival, but I can't raise them well. If it were only a matter of adding a pair of chopsticks, a bowl of rice, and raising children to work in a farm field, I have more than enough. But if I were to provide them with a scientific diet of safe, non-polluting, staple foods and complementary foods, vitamins, and nutrients to arrange preschool tutoring classes, or if I were to have them learn piano, dancing, English, painting, and swimming, to have them work out in a gym and attend a private school, to have private lessons at home when teachers don't teach at school, or when they fail to get into a university of 985, I was able to send them overseas to study, and when they returned, I would have their wedding gifts ready and help them buy a home with two bedrooms plus a car. And finally, they gave me some fat little grandson. If I were to raise children by these standards, I can't do it. Maybe people would ask why you need to meet those standards. Who is forcing you? If you can't afford private schools, then attend public schools. If you can't afford piano lessons, then learn some folk art like clapper talk. Problem solved. Nope, that won't do. Who is forcing me? The general environment. Everyone is doing it. Can you avoid it? As the saying goes, do you want your children to lose on the starting line? It doesn't matter if it works or not. If other people's children are doing it, I must let my children do it as well. Look around. Parents nowadays all seem proficient in playing music, chess, books, painting, martial arts, and calligraphy. Their children might not be as good, but anything less would mean they won't be as competitive. Not to mention extracurricular classes. At 7 a.m., the kid needs to go to school. Who will take him? At 3.30 p.m., when school is over, who picks him up? The teacher invites parents to school all the time. Who can make it? Who will keep an eye on the kid's homework every day? And written posters, homework, decorative paintings, etc all sorts of festivals and holidays. Parents are asked to fund the decoration of the classroom and have a good relationship with the school leaders. June 1st, Children's Day, was just on the top of the news search where it was the center of attention. On Children's Day, parents played beauty warriors on stage. Let me tell you, I watched the show. It was great, but do I have this kind of energy? And once the child is born, who will take care of it? These colleagues of mine have all left their children behind. Hey, both parents are busy. Grandparents take them to school and pick them up after school. On weekends, they say they want to take their children out to play, but the company needs you more than the children. We live under the same roof, but the children don't see their parents even once a month. Look, if I never see my child, what's the point of having a child? So far, I don't feel that I am ready to be a parent. Everyone advises me to have my own children and that I'll get used to it after a while. Your own children are cute. You will enjoy them. I know, but I still feel that I am a child myself. I am too selfish and childish. I complain about the hardships and difficulties of life every day. I am far from mature enough to raise a human being. Can I keep him from crying out on the flight? Can I keep him from running and goofing around in the movie theater? Can I teach him not to bully his classmates and not to be bullied at the same time? Can I treat him as an equal when he asks questions? Maybe I would be okay to be a parent, but if I don't think I could, then I don't deserve to be a parent. The fertility rate is declining, and people like me are to blame. It's projected 7 million or so new births in 2024. I can hardly imagine giving birth to a child and exhausting myself with my time, wealth, energy, and patience to raise him to adulthood. The day he graduates from college, I would call him to my side and tell him, Son, you have grown up. Next, your father will pass on all his life skills and the art of ass kissing. Now go. Go and take the beating of society and face the test of life. I, at the same time, need to go to work overtime as I am not 65 yet and still must work. If we were lucky, we would work in the same office building. On the 11th floor, I am working overtime. On the 18th floor, my child is working overtime. At 12 o'clock at night, we, father and son, would carpool back to the home where we had just finished paying off the mortgage. On the weekend, we all get together to discuss how to get him a mortgage. I've always been asked, aren't you afraid that no one will take care of you when you get old? 
I don't have children, so I can burden them. Moreover, even when I get old, he would still have to work overtime, right? He must make money, right? So raising a child doesn't protect you at old age. Having money gives you protection at old age. I was also advised, shouldn't you consider it again? It's actually not as complicated as you think. So I have stopped thinking about this issue. I read online that a mother wrote in a letter to her child saying, your mother has already experienced and confirmed that the world is happy and joyful, so she brought you here to experience it. I'm here to tell you, my son, your father has already experienced it for you, and what I experienced in this world is different from that mother. So if you want to experience this world, go reincarnate in her family. Next lifetime, I also want to go to that family too.